I have added multiplayer to my single player game, One Bit Adventure. For five years, I've built One Bit Adventure from the ground up to be a single player game with no party system, no matchmaking, no social interactions other than displaying a leaderboard. But I've noticed uh, quite a bit of players still keep asking me to add the most ambitious feature ever which is multiplayer. I'm no expert in making a multiplayer game, but I am going to prove this challenge wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. So let me show you what I've accomplished. So in order to start the multiplayer journey, I actually had to find an SDK that can allow me to implement multiplayer into Unity game engine. And starting off, I went with Photon Engine and used the Pun SDK. Uh, it is free for up to 20 players before you end up having to pay for the server and interactions and stuff. So if you need to download an SDK, definitely Pun is a simple and easy one. Um, I'll leave the link in the description description for me. So as with any multiplayer game, we start off with creating a room so players can connect together, send the information that they need, and then start your adventure. So we have two instances. One is running off of EXE and then the other is running off of Unity. So that way we can see uh, some of the script that is actually running in the game. Uh, on the left hand side, we have a multiplayer game object with a script called Launcher. This is actually going to be handling all of our code for the Phonton network that will allow us to do a lobby. Now, a lot of this code is actually copied and pasted from the documentation, which is very, like I said, it's very simplified and they make it so easy to create a lobby and you'll be able to start joining together players. Uh, the harder part comes later when you try to sync together uh, certain objects, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So. As for the lobby system, we only had to create a few UI elements, uh, a button to ha actually handle finding players, and then the status of the room. So as soon as we click find player, it's going to call a function to create a room if there's no room available. And if there is available, we'll just join. So on the left side, it's waiting for our second player to join before starting a match. And if we click that, you'll notice that they'll sync together. The countdown's a little off but they'll sync together as soon as the main host drops to zero, we start the adventure together. So this is it, this is one bit multiplayer. You'll notice a few things a little bit off. We're actually <laughs> blended together, but that's okay. This was just a huge experiment to see how difficult it would be. And on a scale of one to 10, I would say it's probably a 10 for sure. <laughs> so the lobby system, fairly straightforward. There's not much uh, to talk about, except when we go into the whole level design aspect of one bit and how enemies interact with the host. So let's jump into that. So the way I handled like trying to make single player into multiplayer for one bit, uh, it was fairly much let's create an object and have that be the one that talks to other players in a server. So on the left hand side, we actually have what's called friend objects. And what the friend object does is it talks to other players and does the animations for them while still maintaining the main player control script. So this is officially a single player script that will literally talk to this object and be like, oh, you need to do this because the player moved. Now, if we look at the code, it is actually straightforward. When we wake up, we need to attach a photon view this way that we can communicate to other players how this object works, as well as find the player control script so that we can reuse some of the functions. And if it is ours, we're gonna hide it uh, and update the skin as well to let other players know how we look like. So if I actually run this again and actually have like pyromancer or necromancer it will update the skin so that other players can know you are that class type so that's just a wake so we're just doing that part to set up the player now the next function for move target pulse is essentially us telling other players where our vector 2 our position is going to be and then having us do the animations 
uh, once we send it. So other players will animate it themselves. We just tell them where we moved to. Another function that was pretty much simplified was animate attack uh this is telling other players hey we attacked this enemy let's show that we attacked the enemy so if we go back to the game and move into this enemy you'll notice that we do the attack animation the enemy does nothing and when i killed the enemy it's still there now this is me just like i said trying to see what i could do with multiplayer and I could say straightforward, handling the player is a lot easier than handling entities such as enemies, but for the most part, it worked. You're able to see other players move and you're able to see them attack. That's just the crucial element of multiplayer, doing those baby steps before you move on to the bigger steps. Obviously, it would be a lot simpler if we started multiplayer, but that's part of the challenge right now. The next step into doing multiplayer was to try to sync the worlds together. Now, for those of you that don't know, this is an endless scroller. And by that, it means the chunks of the world are constantly being placed one after the other. There are certain random factors that occur in order to generate the world. So we have a lot of different things, but thankfully there are features to make it easier to sync together. Uh, one of the most notable, and I think this is in the lines of like procedural generation is to save the random number state. Now, this is essentially what like you would seed a number generator and then any random numbers after that would be essentially the same variables. So <laughs> to get this more into a simplified version, the host will send a number and that number will be, let's say 1000. Now all the other players will create chunks based off the number 1000 and if there are different random number variables that will affect how the levels look but fortunately most of one bit's code is they does they don't get modified as much so if i were to run up with the second player on the screen we'll have the world be synced together until we reach a place that we basically are waiting for the host to create that world and if we go through you'll see that we're pretty much loading the same chunks and then it's still the same chunks that is appearing synchronously without us having to tell the other player every single object in the world which would stress the servers out a lot uh now you'll notice right here in this area we're actually looking at the numbers that are being sent to each other and that's the host telling what seed to provide in order to load what chunks and they're matching meaning that this is working to an extent <laughs> this is a simplified way to load a procedurally or random generated world to each other by seeding it and then sending it to other players so that they could generate it on their own. A little complex, but promise you, <laughs> it did take about one hour for me to make this, so it, it works. And I think uh, when it comes to level generation, uh, simplifying it the most is gonna provide the better outcome. So in terms of getting the enemies to work in a multiplayer code, I could not get it to work exactly how, but I did come across some things that helped me for the future. In reality, a lot of the codes that are being sent or functions that are being set have to be very simplified. One of the main issues was when I would send enemy information over, I would actually send the data that was directly related to the enemy type. For an example, if we go into level generator, scroll very much to the top. So if you go to the enemy type and actually look at the actual class, all of this information should not be sent across the network. That's just a lot of stuff and essentially you cannot send sprites over the network so you're really down to sending simplified like integers that relate to a list that everyone has 
basically access to. So mistake number one was spawning enemies. I've always used that and I think that's a bad habit of mine. Uh, it, it's just reference a, a number to the database versus actually sending and copying the database over. So that was one of the main issues, which I ended up changing and fixing. Another issue was even though I had set a seed to this, there were some other variables that relies on whether the player is near them or their level or their type that affects the outcome of spawning each enemy. So <laughs> a lot of other variables come into play that just made spawning and also moving and attacking enemies just all the more reason why I sh probably should not have started this uh, challenge in the first place. But for the most part, I think this was by far the best experience in terms of trying to learn multiplayer in terms of my future and how to handle different aspects of the code. The challenge of adding multiplayer to One Bit Adventure was basically doomed from the start, but it did give me the experience I needed to basically plan ahead for Dungeon of Greed. So if you do enjoy videos like this one, be sure to give me a like and subscribe and let me know what features you want me to attempt next. I know multiplayer was pretty much a, <laughs> a little too big to try and do, but maybe you might have other ideas that I haven't thought of. So thank you guys for watching and until next time, this is Jonathan Concepcion logging out. I will catch you guys later.